It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. All right, welcome back, Wine Two Five listeners. We've got a big day today. We've got a guest on the show. We've got tons of fun, and we're going to be talking about wine films. Thanks, everybody, for being here with us, and let's get right into the show, Val. What's in your glass? All right, so, well, what's dripping down my arm uh, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> don't ask, is Paul Roger Champagne Reserve. It's a beautiful bottle that we purchased to celebrate our four-year anniversary, and it is drinking absolutely deliciously, and it looks off my arm really well, too, so there's that. <laughs> What are you drinking, Steph? I'm sure I'm sure John wants to be licking that off right now, Val. Gosh, save some for him. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, and congratulations. I should clink my glass again for you. Well, let's do that. That's how I that's, yeah, there we go. That's how I spilled it the first time. All right. <laughs> what you got? Well, so I'm drinking I'm drinking a white wine blend that I just picked up recently. Um, I like it because of the price. It was thirteen forty nine, and it is a Fess Parker Marcellus, which is the, the name of Fess's wife. It's from Santa Barbara. It's a 2014 blend of Viognier, Roussan, Marsan, and Grenache Blanc. And... You know what I like about it? It tastes like juicy fruit, kind of some pineapple, and it's got good body, and it's inexpensive. I like it. It, 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 it drinks more like a ex, more expensive wine. I like it. Yeah. And I have popcorn. Yeah. And I made some, uh, I made some truffle salted popcorn oh. to go with it with our movie theme. Oh, my gosh. That sounds delicious. And what's really cool today, listeners, is our guest is with us, too. His name is Gary Match. Now, his glass is sealed because uh, he's technically still at work. So we're going to be talk talking to him about his product, Ready to Drink Packaging. So we're going to get right into that before we get into the truffled popcorn and the movie talk. <laughs> but uh, let's first introduce our guest, and then, then we can talk about our movie. So with us today is Gary. Uh, he is in Phoenix. That's right. Am I correct? Yes. Yep. And his product is Ready to Drink Packaging. And if you go to readytodrinkpackaging.com, you see an example of some really, really cool wine packaging. And for those of you that may have not caught episodes 12, 13, and 14 of this podcast, particularly episode 14, we were talking about alternative packaging and the reasons that you want to have something like this available to the market. And it is definitely becoming more popular. Gary's caught my eye actually on Twitter. Believe it or not, um, I actually kind of, I'm, I'm using the quotes, met Gary on Twitter because I, I saw the packaging. I thought that is just super cool. And so he's with us today and he's going to talk about his uh, packages, which have, no kidding, wine and snacks in the same set. And I'm sure he could put that more eloquently, but hey, welcome Gary. First, tell us a little bit about yourself and your product before we go ahead and uh, start, start asking questions. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for having me, Valerie and Stephanie. Um, again, my name is Gary Match, and I am a mechanical engineer. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and I've invented this uh, ready-to-drink wine package that you just you just mentioned, and and you did a good job of explaining it. It's it's a uh, glass of wine in a standard size wine glass that also includes either a second serving of wine or a uh, paired snack like cheese and crackers, pretzels, or whatever you'd want. Nice. It's it's uh, something I've been working on for the past three years, and I have a patent pending and two uh, provisional patents as well on it right now. So it's it's a lengthy process to patent something like this, but um, things are moving along pretty well. Cool. Well, and Gary, what was your inspiration for this product? Uh, well, uh, three years ago, I was watching Shark Tank. I'm a big fan. And maybe remember uh, James Martin from Copa Divino was on, 
and he presented a ready. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, one. He, it um, it was a good one. He presented a ready to drink wine container that uh, you know the sharks were interested in, but he wanted to keep the uh, the design to himself for his own brand of wine rather than license license it out, which the other sharks wanted to do. And um, as I watched the show, I looked at it and I thought I. I can do something that I think would be better than that. And my goal was to go on the Shark Tank and, and present what I thought would be a better design. Nice. So I came up with this design, and I auditioned for Shark Tank actually early, earlier this year, but, but haven't got on yet. But I'm, I'm still going to try. Oh, my gosh. Well, you have to yeah. let us know so we can watch. We say, oh, my God, we know Gary. <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> I'll let everyone know. I think Shark Tank looks terrifying, but good on you. That is so cool. Well, <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's a it's a goal that I have. We'll see we'll see if it uh, if I get there. But um, in the end, I want to make this design successful. Was it like the zips? Yeah. Is that what it was on the Shark Tank? I thought. Part part of me. Was it the zips wine that they had on there? You said Copa Divino, but is it the one they call zips now, or is the Copa Divino something separate? Because um, I've never heard of it. They're, they're separate. Um, Copa de Vino was on twice, and then um, Zips was on after Copa de Vino. So they've had three ready to drink okay. wines on. Wow. Yeah. So each time I see it, I get. I didn't yeah, know that. I, I, uh, I got more and more motivated to um, make this happen. Yeah, for sure. Wow. And so, okay, we have some ideas, I think, about, you know, what makes those wine ready to go packaging so important and and we talked about it in our previous episode but what do you think it brings to the wine community at large uh well i think that it brings convenience and it also Mm -hmm. uh, allows you to enjoy wine in places that if you have a glass container you would not be able to otherwise enjoy like um, you know, obvious examples like the beach or movie theaters, sporting events, um, things like that. And, and then also, uh, as I learn more and more about um, uh, people who enjoy wine, they don't want to open a bottle of wine and just have one glass and, lend, and then let the bottle sit for, you know, a long period of time so, um, where you would have the wine spoil. So it lets you to open a fresh glass of wine, finish that without worrying about finishing the bottle. Yeah. When I was looking at your website, I was actually thinking about having those on the golf course and how cool that would be. Yeah, that, that's another, another great um, place that you could use these. It's a great idea. Yeah. And my whole thing is the airlines. I, I, you know, I think of, you know, the whole solves your snack and wine problem right there. You don't have to juggle the silly little bag of three pretzels if they give them to you at all anymore. Mm -hmm. You've got everything built. And then you have to, like, open the wine bottle and then pour it in a cup and then it spills. I was on a flight where this poor woman couldn't get the bottle open. And she's turning and turning and turning. <laughs> and I guess the cap didn't separate from the the capsule there and it was just like turning and turning and turning because for those of us who fly economy a lot you know it's not like we're drinking good stuff up front so we get these little bottles with these weird little twist off caps and i thought you know something like this would be really awesome you know you've got your 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 snack for those of you that haven't seen it submersed in the in the wine and gary can you explain a little bit how that works so i don't mess it up yeah and and it's it's something that evolved over time uh, my goal when i first started working on this was to allow you to package a single serving of wine in a standard wine glass a standard size wine glass so if you notice um all other uh, single serve wines are packaged in a miniature wine glass so that when you have 187 milliliters of wine the um the fill level is right up by the rim of the glass, so you minimize headspace. So as I, so what I've come up with is a uh, secondary or a second container that that's sealed to the bottom of the lid, so that when the lid is installed on the main wine glass, the second part is submerged in the wine glass and it drives up the uh, the fill level up to the near near the rim of the wine glass. And then, like I mentioned, it evolved over time to where this secondary container also is used or is used to um, hold snacks or even a second glass of wine. 
So it, um, it, it serves a purpose beyond just storing a second glass of wine or crackers. It, it actually improves the, will improve the shelf life of the wine by reducing headspace. So wait a minute, Gary. Are you saying that I can have red and white in the same glass? Yes. <laughs> it's like, you know, red or white. Like, uh, how about both? Okay, here's a single both. serve package <laughs> with a glass of red and the white submerged in it. Because <laughs> I like that. You don't even have to choose. Yeah, Would you, you like red both. or white? I'll have both. There we go. I want it all. That's perfect. Perfect for those who want it all. Yeah. I actually had some samples early on where I had uh, red in the center and then white in the outer part. So, um, yeah, you could absolutely have both. There's all different kinds of combinations. Now, what what kind of um, selection are you going to have? Or is that still kind of uh, consumer demand? Yeah, my, my goal right now is to partner with a winery and, and license my design or multiple wineries. Um, and then it would be up to them to decide what they want to package in the center, the center container. Ah, oh, okay. But I, I want to you know, give them options, give them ideas. So that's why, uh, like on Twitter, you've seen some of the pictures I put out that have pretzels, wine, cheese and crackers, nuts, chocolates in, this, in the center part. Yeah. That is awesome. Cool. Now, how have you tested the product with some surveys, or how did how did you test the viability of the product? Well, um, one of my neighbors is a distributor for a, uh, a beer company, and he he also used to be in the wine industry. And I uh, shared my design with him, and met with one of his friends who's also in the wine industry, and um, they they both thought the idea was great. And were very interested in it, and uh, so they motivated me to pursue this. Even you know, keep pursuing this. Um, and then I've had uh, friends and family also look at it and 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 use it to to see what they thought about it. And the uh, feedback that I've gotten is is positive. But but a lot a lot of my inspiration is just seeing how well the other single serve wines are doing out in in the market right now. They're really doing well. So I, I think there's a great demand for this. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Yeah. Let's see here, Val. What else do we want to ask Gary? You know, the packaging of the world. Yes. How did they hear about you and Ready to Drink Packaging? Tell us about that. Well, um, once I, I started off with Facebook, putting my design there and then a website. And I wanted to find ways to get my design out into the public eye. So I started doing searches for any kind of de- packaging design contests that I could enter. And Packaging okay. of the World uh, allowed me to submit, submit my design to them. And then they, they came back and said they liked it. And they would, they would uh, feature it on their website. And I was also on Trend Hunter, which I'm not quite sure how they found me. But it might have been through Packaging of the World. But they, they had a nice write-up on my design and featured my design on their site as well, which is very exciting for me. Yeah, congratulations. That's great. That's some great coverage for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's exciting. Well, so, Gary, when did you start inventing? I mean, did you have a product before this one? And, and did you know that you were always an entrepreneur or... How did how did this come about? Well, in my previous job, I was a design engineer, and I have a couple of patents through work um, that you know that I came up with my own, and the designs were patented. and And I loved the um, you know the satisfaction of seeing my product, what I designed, um, out in the field. It's uh, actually it's installed on the A three eighty. Uh, Airbus. I just I enjoy designing and always had an interest. And in just this, you know, after watching Shark Tank, I I got the idea to do something on my own. And uh, it's it's quite a bit different designing something on your own without the, the backing of a big company to pay all the bills. But it's it's very rewarding so far. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely attest to that for sure. I guess it's like the first time you're like if you're a musician, the first time you hear your own song on the radio, it's like oh my god, that's me. Yeah. Or, oh my gosh, I invented that. <laughs> You know, I don't know if it's the same thing or not. It's just <laughs> right. Well, yeah, especially when you know your your friends or your family you say, "I saw your product," or you know something like that. You're like, "Oh my gosh, it's for real! I'm not totally crazy." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. 
Okay. Last question? Um, well, yeah, let's go with the next question. Well, I saw on your website, Gary, that you're going to have a video coming soon, and we're looking forward to that. When When is that going to launch? Well, um, th- we're going to be shooting this weekend. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a videographer who lives in my neighborhood who's willing to help me. And uh, we've shot some videos cool. so far, and uh, we're going to do some more this weekend. And I'm hoping we can wrap it up this weekend because I'm anxious to, to get the video out there. You know, I want to get as much exposure as I can, so th- I think this will be a great way to, to add to that. So keep keep an eye out for it in the next few weeks. We'll definitely do that. You know, We'll definitely share it with our listeners, too, because, again, our, our listeners, well, they're... There are some wine professionals out there, and then we've got some drinkers out there who are always looking for a better way to do it. So we can certainly look out for that. Great. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I'll let you know when it comes out. So before we dig in, hey, Gary, do you do you, uh, do you have any favorite wine movies? Have you watched any? Are there any that you'd like to see? What do you, uh, what's, your, what's your take on the wine movie world? Oh, gosh. Now you're putting me on the spot. There, there was one that I saw several years ago that I really enjoyed, and it had um, the, uh, George from Seinfeld. Oh. Do you? Do you know George which one I'm talking about? I don't think I saw it. Do you remember the theme of that movie at all? Um, I think um, these friends went on a t- two friends went on a trip, and I don't know if it was Napa Valley or where, but they drank a lot of wine and and uh, got into some trouble. But it was a, it was a good movie. I just I can't remember the name. Oh, with the women. You know, it sounds like sideways. That's it. Sideways. That's it. No. Yes. It sounds like sideways. I didn't realize. Oh, he he was in that. He was one of the main characters, wasn't he? I haven't seen that movie in forever. So, yeah, okay, so yeah, I got some trouble with some women's, okay, that was Sideways. If anyone drinks Merlot, I'm out of here, that movie, <laughs> that movie people call responsible for the pulling up of Merlot vines and then, you know, it becoming less popular and then the popularity of Pinot Noir, which is really interesting how a movie can affect the wine industry. And of course, you know, we know now that Merlot is not a substandard grape and some wonderful things happen with it. Yeah, Sideways was that movie, that was hilarious. I mean, I think they were in um, the Lompoc area. I'm trying to think down that Santa Barbara area down that way. Mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. Yeah, Mm because I I kind of saw hints of like Solvang and all that area down there too. Now, I will tell you my favorite movie, wine movie of all time, is A Good Year with Russell Crowe. And I didn't even hear about this movie until like two years after it had come out. A friend of mine told me about it. I'm like, how have I not seen this? That the movie was so well done I actually went to Target and bought it for like five bucks and have watched it again and again and again it's such a great story you know because he goes from being like hard hearted and kind of softens up and ends up running his family vineyard which I love that that was I would say that's my favorite wine movie of all time followed by Psalm I have to say Steph, you've seen Psalm, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I own it. And I own A Good Year as well. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I've watched Psalm twice now. In fact, the, the sequel to that's coming out. It's going to be showing in November at the Napa Wine Festival. And it should be out, I think, for the masses shortly after, if not early 2016. And then, of course, A Year in Burgundy, which is more of a documentary, but uh, A Year in Champagne and A Year in Burgundy, uh, both of those movies, I would say, uh, bring up a third because there, there are more documentaries and they just make you thirsty. But I don't know, Steph, what, what are your favorite wine movies of all time? I love another Hollywood movie that's uh, from 1995, French Kiss with Meg Ryan and Kevin Klein. It's so darling. I can watch that one over and over and over again, seriously, and how he's like trying to bring in that vine you know <laughs> through customs and stuff it's so fabulous and meg ryan with her lactose, lactose intolerance, intolerance. <laughs> that's that is really funny and you know i wasn't into wine when i watched this movie so i forgot all about him trying to sneak the vine thing in oh yeah, yeah. right yes no it's so his, his whole obsession in life is planting a vineyard yeah and I totally and, forgot that part uh, of the movie. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it's the romance of being a wine grower itself. I mean, making wine and, and that romance, and then also the romance between a man and a woman. So it's really awesome. Love, love, love it. Um, and then the other the other couple ones, well, we mentioned The Good Year. I love that one too. And then Bottle Shock with Alan Rickman and Bill Pullman, that that's a great one too. 2008 is when that one came out. And uh, the other thing that I spent a lot of time watching and taking the quizzes were was this. Uh, it's a two disc, five hour movie series from Jancis Robinson called The Wine Course. Now it's it's dated now because it was produced in 1995. But when I first got into 
wine studies, I was glued to these two discs and I would take the quizzes over and over and over again. And I thought it was a great tool. I mean, it really, you know, there wasn't that much great video uh, content on the online at that time. So it was nice to have a video that you could put into the DVD player and just watch and learn and, and then challenge yourself with different levels of quizzes. Like they have a beginner quiz, intermediate quiz, you know. So that was a lot of fun. And um, But, yeah, so I enjoy documentaries and I enjoy some of the Hollywood films too so there's just so many great movies out there and we can post a list of <laughs> our long list of recommended <laughs> movies we can totally do that. and I, I like how you know all the stars names and I don't like I'm so not down with famous people and who they are and and no idea like I know Russell Crowe because how can you not but other than that it's like I you know who who's that guy that played George on Seinfeld I don't know you know, and, you know, people say, oh, that's so-and-so from whatever. I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know who that is. So I like how you, like, know the names yeah. of the... And I know Meg Ryan, because actually the guy that used to do my hair did her hair at one time. And so, um, oh. yeah, believe it or not. But yeah. I love that, that you know who the famous people are, and I don't. But the wine movies <laughs> out there, there are quite a few that I've never heard of. And we're going to go ahead and describe those here real quick. The Wine Mag, which is the wine enthusiast writers, have listed the 10 greatest wine movies of all time recently. And I'm going to give you three that I've never heard of. Steph, let's see if you've heard of these. The first one's called Heavenly Vintage. It's from 2009. It's a tale, and this is a quote, of a 19th century French peasant who longs to make great wine. In his quest, he's inspired by his beautiful wife and proud baroness, as well as... Xaos, I guess it's Zas, a male angel who tempts with tantalizing secrets. Ooh la la. Wow. Oh. Wow. I know. Have you yeah, heard of that? Yeah, I've never heard of that. I've never heard no, of that. No, I'm Gary, totally going to rent that. No, I haven't. I yeah, haven't okay. That. Here's another one. Now, this is from 1969, so Val was all of three years old. In 1943, the German army occupies the Italian hillside of Santa Victoria. The troops want to confiscate the region's prized wine, but the wily, oft-inebriated mayor, who's Anthony Quinn, so that's one of those famous people there, stuff, and the townspeople hide <laughs> one million bottles in a cave, and the title of that movie is The Secret of Santa Victoria. Now, I know during World War II, this happened all over France, because we talked about wine and war last week, that wines were hot, hidden behind fake walls and buried and all that. So this isn't far-fetched from the truth, but I did not know about this movie. How about you guys? Yeah. Nope, I didn't know. No? Nope. No? Nope. I know, right? And so the movie list is growing. Make some more popcorn, because here's the last one. The Year of the Comet, 1992. Instead of vineyards, the setting is the Scottish Highlands for this caper, in which a prim young woman uncovers the most expensive bottle of wine in the world. Can she and her boorish bodyguard fend off thieves and temptations of unlikely love? You have to rent the movie to find I'm out. I'm going to watch I... that one first. I'm watching that one. I know, right? I, I, they all sound really, like, juicy. I mean, <laughs> gosh. I've never heard of any of these, so these are recommendations out there from wine enthusiasts. And obviously, I've been living under a rock, Steph. I don't know. Uh, what else you got as far as uh, movies? I don't. We're under the same rock, apparently. <laughs> I seriously, I don't know how that, I don't know about those movies. I know I've done some Google searches looking for great wine movies. And, and the damn Amazon Prime, I don't know why it doesn't recommend these when I'm on Amazon. <laughs> Aren't they supposed to read your mind? You know, I, I thought they were because they, they definitely, you know, every time I click on something, they say, hey, um, you might like this book. I'm like, yeah, I already have it. I bought it from you, remember? You know, so, yeah, Amazon hasn't really quite <laughs> squared that away yet. Um, should we go ahead and move on, Steph, or did you want to go on with any more movies here? Yeah. Uh, no, I think we better move to our factoid. Yeah. So, our factoid for this week. Okay. So, most of you may realize that Dom Perignon today, 300 years ago, is the day that he passed away, and he was 77 years old. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Dom Perignon is, it's not just a Moet and Chandon prestige cuvee, <laughs> which is a bottle of champagne. Mm -hmm. It was launched in 1936, so there's that. You might have seen that on the shelves or heard of people drinking it. 
but he is known for his work in Champagne, and in particular with integrating the use of Spanish cork, thicker bottle glass. So remember the bottles were exploding from pressure way back in the day before they knew how to control that second fermentation. He was also credited for doing blends in the cuvee and also for encouraging harvest during the cool hours of the day. And since it's harvest season right now, this is important because that's when the acid levels are higher in the grapes and, you know, it's not all sugar. So he was also uh, credited for designing a shallow champagne price. But despite what you may have heard, he did not discover champagne. And I think a lot of people think that. They think he discovered champagne. When actually he was kind of brought in to kind of stop that evil boiling that was happening in the wine that was actually a second fermentation. People thought it was like evil spirits or something, and they weren't sure, but they thought it was a fault. We know now it was a second fermentation that had paused over winter in the wine. He also, I bet you didn't know this, made the first truly white wine from red grapes, a Blanc de Noir, if you will. So it's because of his interest Mm. in viticulture and winemaking that we can credit him with a lot of things historically. Yeah, so had he not been around, I mean, wine might look different. So I think that's interesting. That's your factoid for today, Dom Perignon, what he contributed to the wine world. And today is the 300-year anniversary of his death. Yeah. I know, right? What about uh, shout-outs? Cheers to Dom. Cheers to Dom. I'm going to just take a sip of champagne while you do your shout-outs real quick. Okay. (laughs) Okay, first of all, Gary, shout out to you. Thanks for being our guest today. Well, thank you very much. It was an honor to to be with both of you today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we are just so happy to hear about your product, and thank you for being here. I also want to give a shout out to my friends, Chef Jason Schaefer and James Gurley. They just opened their new restaurant in Windsor called Hearth. So congratulations to you both. I can't wait to try out the Neapolitan-style pizzas, fun and shareable appetizers, and wood-fired beef, poultry, and lamb. Yeah, you guys, like this is a really cool new concept. Everything is wood-fired that possibly can be. So that's exciting. We're going to be there next week to check it out. Ooh, that sounds awesome. I'm going to have to go check that out too next time I come up that way. Yeah. What about you, Val? My shout out is to, I'm going to give a shout out to Carl Rosa. He is the proprietor of the Sushi Club of Houston with over 17,000 members. He does sushi lessons. He takes uh, people to Japan on tours. I know he's got some tours coming up. I just sent my friend his way. He also managed to procure a bottle of wine from Japan for me to try out that's not available in this country. Uh, I still haven't checked it out yet. I'm getting ready to leave town for a week. But I really look forward to trying the Tamba Wines Assemblage Rouge, which is from a winery that started in 1979. At least the grape growing did it, which is just northwest of Kyoto in Japan. So, hey, thanks, Carl, for uh, thinking of me and offering to bring a bottle back. I look forward to meeting up with you next week. He's actually um, got a podcast starting up next year as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what's going on in the sushi world. And his story is really cool. Be be looking out for more of that story, which brings us to next week. Ah, next week. Well, since Val mentioned it, Dom Perignon died 300 years ago today. We thought next week we would talk about some of our favorite historical figures and what they contributed to our current drinking goodness. So yeah, that's next week. That's right. You know, his history's way more interesting when you got a glass in one hand. And and like I said before, I never was a history buff until I started learning about alcohol. But totally love booze history. We think you guys will too. So we hope you'll tune in. But as always, our time has gone way too quickly. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to t- chat with Steph, uh, you can find her on Twitter at Albarello Soap and on the Albarello Soap Facebook page. And I'm also on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed and on the Vino with Val Facebook page and on Instagram as Vino with Val. Gary, where can our listeners find you and all that, all that packaging goodness that you've got going on out there? Well, you can reach me uh, at my website, or sorry, my uh, email address, which is gary at readytodrinkpackaging.com. And my Twitter name is GaryMatch1. That's with the, uh, the number one. And just, just so you all know, all right. my, my last name is spelled M-A-T-S-C-H. There's an S in there. That's right. And you've got a Facebook page, too. Yes, I do. Uh, Ready to Drink Packaging. 
is uh, my Facebook page. All right. And I think we've shared some stuff on Wine25 as well. So definitely look and see what he's got going on. I think he's a rising star in the wine packaging world. And Def? And you guys can find us at Wine25's Facebook page on Twitter and Wine25.com. Please email us at Wine25 at gmail.com. And... Give us a review. We'd love to get reviews on iTunes or Stitcher. So share us with your friends and keep listening. Thanks, everybody. Cheers and cheers to Gary. Cheers to Gary. Cheers to you guys and uh, see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.